Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're going to look at three of the minor judges, Ibsen, Elon, and Abdon. We don't have a whole lot of information about them, but there's just enough in these few verses to exposit an applicable truth. Let's begin with Ibsen. We're in Judges chapter 12. Here's verse 8. Ibsen, who was from Bethlehem, judged Israel after Jephthah and had 30 sons. He gave his 30 daughters, okay, so that's a total of 60 kids, in marriage to men outside the tribe and brought back 30 wives for his sons from outside the tribe. Ibsen judged Israel seven years, and when he died, he was buried in Bethlehem. He is from Bethlehem, according to verse 8. He is buried in Bethlehem, according to verse 10. Bethlehem, uh, according to the original allocations of land for the tribes, as we'll see in our study of the book of Joshua, was right at the top of the territory allocated toward the tribe of Judah, just south of the allocation of land originally uh, outlined for the tribe of Benjamin. And it doesn't necessarily give him a tribal affiliation. We just know that he was Jephthah's successor. Jephthah was in charge for a short six years, and uh, Ibsen is in charge for a comparatively short seven years. Now, what is the obvious giveaway in verse 9 about having 30 sons and 30 daughters? This guy is practicing polygamy. Now, it was in our curriculum last week. It's It comes up all the time. It's a common even critique of the Bible, but it needs to be said again. God never ordained polygamy. God never prescribed polygamy. God has said from the very beginning of the Bible to become one flesh. Nonetheless, we do see men of God practice polygamy. And we see God do mighty, beautiful, incredible things through their families. We even see Sarah encourage, uh, you know, an extramarital affair, for example. But God uses the story mightily. That's where the Ishmaelites come from. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's all within the foreknowledge of God. None of it ever caught God off guard, but it needs to be reiterated. Apparently, God never prescribed polygamy. Moreover, he didn't just practice polygamy. We see that he deliberately does the opposite with all 60 of his kids than what God said to do. He's supposed to be the guy in charge He's the one who's presiding over Israel, and he is quite strategically, deliberately running his family in a way that is the polar opposite of what God told them to do. This is partly why things get worse and worse in the book of Judges. As you marry someone who doesn't believe in your God, and it doesn't necessarily say that they were marrying local Canaanite pagans, they're at least marrying outside the tribe, but it's, it's reasonable to believe that they are marrying outside of even the Hebrew faith. When that happens, you're no longer the influencer, you're the influenced. What can light have in common with darkness, like we saw in our series through First and Second Corinthians, uh, was really about like the one thing that you need to have in common with your spouse is the most important thing in your soul, your salvation. Everything else, everything else is secondary to that main thing. Uh, you, you, you're not supposed to marry someone who doesn't believe in your God. And I've, I've seen it fail over and over again. There are some exceptions. There are times when one spouse leads another to Christ. There's even instructions for how that works in Peter's writings. Should someone get saved after being married and they're married to a non-Christian now? However, what Ibsen was doing was clearly against the will of God. Let's also talk about the motivation for deliberately having such a family. This is the opposite of Jephthah. Jephthah had one daughter and he killed her. Ibsen had 60 kids. And this is a way of growing in influence. This is a this is a pretty solid retirement plan too, I would imagine. But his his name was important to him. He intended to profligate it and he did. We see again what's missing uh, from this text. There's never a word about the Holy Spirit coming upon Ibsen. There's also no word about the number of years of prosperity that Israel experienced under Ibsen's leadership. There's just stability. At least there's no report of a massive civil war breaking out under Ibsen's leadership. But what's missing is the anointing of God. He was merely occupying an office. And in that time, the one thing we really know about him was that he was all about some Ibsen. So would you guard your heart against this kind of legacy? When you die, 
All right. If, if, if the, if there were a book of, uh, you know, Seattle Christians, an imaginary book of the Bible, I know, but just for the sake of illustration, would you consider your legacy? This is all we really know about Ibsen. We don't see him ushering in a time of prosperity. We don't see him uh, bringing people back to the Word of God. We see him doing the opposite of what the Word of God said, and we can see that he would not have qualified for the office of pastor in the New Testament. He's not managing his own household. He's doing the opposite of what God said in his own home. And so, man, it just it does bring to mind the question of spiritual legacy. Ibsen was all about some Ibsen, all right? Are you all about some you? Make it your mission to lead as many people to Jesus as you possibly can before you die. If your legacy is all about your own wealth and about your own fame, your own glory, your own reputation, and how you look to outsiders, for example, then it's going to be empty for you. But if your goal, this is like the mission statement of the Redemption Church and JCM, to lead as many people to Jesus as you can before you die then ironically, giving your life up actually will add more meaning to it. I saw something funny written on the internet. Somebody said, I, have a, I struggle dealing with the idea that one day someone on earth will think of me for the last time and I'll be forgotten forever. And then the hilarious reply came, not if I eat the Mona Lisa. <laughs> that is one way to be remembered forever. Not that it matters if you're remembered forever, but I think there's a far better way to go about seeing to it in your last days that your legacy has meaning that lasts forever. That is to give your legacy to God, to give it up, to see to it that everything you do is ultimately in the name of leading as many people to Jesus as you possibly can before you die. No matter what you do professionally then, the coworkers you lead to Christ they're saved and they're saved forever. That is an eternal significance to your occupation, regardless of the field you're in. That is a legacy that actually lasts forever. Who cares if they remember my name? Who cares if they remember your name? I want them to remember the name of Jesus. I want to lead people to Jesus. I want to see people saved and saved forever. I look at Ibsen and I see a way not to go. So, considering your legacy, if you were recorded in the book of Judges, what would it say about you? May your legacy be one that points people to Jesus, points people to Jesus, points people to Jesus. That is a legacy that matters forever. 